Hi and welcome to the channel. Today I'm in North Carolina. It is hot, it is humid, and today I'm going to talk about my favorite birds to photograph. So come along and enjoy this adventure. Well, last night I was watching um, Thomas Heaton and he was talking about how he would love to take July and August off. And I gotta tell you, I think that, that is something that I think is very true for bird photography. Uh, the main reason why it is, is that um, most of these birds, so right now I'm here in the deep south in North Carolina. I'm in the center part of the state. So it is 95 degrees right now at 9.30 in the morning. It's 100% humidity. Um, it is just brutally hard to um, photograph birds this time of year. Um, I am seeing here in birds, but it's very difficult to photograph them because there's just so many leaves in the trees. Um, the birds tend to be a lot more active this time of year because you got young birds looking for food, you got adults feeding young birds. Um, you have a lot going on and it can be incredibly difficult to get any kind of um, photos of a bird this time of year. That and the fact that the heat is just brutal. So I'm going to talk about five birds that I love taking pictures of. Um, I would love to hear what you think your favorite birds are to take pictures of. Um, I've kind of been uh, playing with this list a little bit. Um, one of the birds that are going to be on the list is a bird that I have never taken a really good picture of. Um, so tell me what you think your five favorite birds are. Um, I comment and I respond to every comment that I get and I look forward to reading your comments. Well, number five is the belted kingfisher. Now, I hear some people out there kind of giggling to themselves. I mean, the belted kingfisher, what's the big deal? I mean, it's a pretty bird, but you know. Uh, when I first got into birding, um, I always thought of the belted kingfisher as my nemesis bird. I could never get a photograph of it. Every time I tried to get a picture of it, it would fly off and I would never get the picture. Um, and it took me a while to learn and you know, it's kind of, you know, um, I keep on saying the learning curve for birding is sometimes like this. Um, belted kingfishers have hunting spots. So they have four, five, six hunting spots that they go to and they go in a circle around them. And um, if you wait at one of these hunting spots, that bird will eventually come around and be back there. Um, I didn't know this. I would just walk up to where the hunting spot was and if the belted kingfisher wasn't there, I would just leave. And it took me a while to learn that you had to slow down and to take pictures of belted kingfishers. Um, I don't know if it's so much for the beauty of the bird or just the fact that the belted kingfisher to me is like a giant evolution in my bird photography. But anyways, number five is belted kingfisher. Well, number four is the yellow-billed cuckoo. Um, the yellow-billed cuckoo comes to the southern part of the United States in the summertime. They arrive in the spring, they leave early in the fall, um, and they migrate as far south as Argentina, but most of them spend it, their winters in Central America and Mexico. Um, the yellow-billed cuckoo, I think one of the reasons why I really love this bird is because of its um, European legacy. So I remember watching a uh, documentary about cuckoos in Europe and they were a parasitic bird there and I always thought of them as this exotic bird that you only find like in the central part of Europe or someplace like that or Africa or someplace like that not realizing that um, we have cuckoos here in the United States um, the yellow-billed cuckoo unlike its European counterpart is not a parasitic bird um, we do have parasitic birds here. The uh, brown-headed cowbird is a perfect example of that. And a parasitic bird is a bird that lays its eggs in another bird's nest. When that bird hatches, it pushes the other birds out of the nest and its foster parents raise the bird. Um, the yellow-billed cuckoo is a pretty brownish kind of bird. It is, um, I feel, a striking bird. But I think one of the reasons why I feel like it's my favorite bird is because one of it's, it's kind of hard to photograph. I mean, the best time to photograph the uh, yellow-billed cuckoo, it just has it when they get here in the springtime or just before they leave in August and September. And um, I have found August and September by far is when I see most of my yellow-billed cuckoos. Um, I hear them 
like when I was walking through the woods here, I heard them calling. But um, it's to me, it's number four, um, and I think that's the reason why I like it. <laughs> well, number three is the bobolink. The bobolink is the furthest flying bird of all the migratory, migratory songbirds in the New World. This bird breeds up in upstate New York, in New England, uh, up in Canada in that area, and it flies all the way down to the central part of South America. That's a 12,500 mile round trip. Um, it's just incredible when you think about this. The bird is a beautiful bird. It's a striking bird. Um, and it's a fairly easy bird to photograph. One of the reasons I think I like about it, some of the migratory birds that migrate through North Carolina are here for literally one or two days and then they're gone. Uh, the bobolink usually stops here on the way back from its breeding ground for at least two or three weeks. Um, this year, I was able to photograph bobolinks in North Carolina for a couple of weeks in the springtime, which was kind of exciting. But anyways, um, bobolinks are number three on my list just because um, just I didn't know they existed and they're just an exciting bird to take pictures of. Number two, the grasshopper sparrow. Now, it's not the most beautiful bird on the face of the earth. And I think one of the reasons why I like it is that it's a kind of an exotic bird. Um, you can definitely take a picture of a grasshopper sparrow if you have them in your area. Um, they are um, not as common as song sparrows and uh, house sparrows, but they are fairly easy. Once you find an area where they're breeding, if you stay in there and just wait, you will see a grasshopper sparrow jump up on a plate of grass and start calling or on a fence post and start calling. And um, I have found that one of the best places for me to photograph them is an empty parking lot that's in a field. And you know, the, the areas that I have found the most of them is at pull-offs on highways. So you'll be at a pull-off on a highway and they will be singing in the grass around them. And you know, it's not very hard birding, it's um, exciting. And the great thing I like about them is that once one starts calling, usually another one will respond and they kind of get in this fuss over stuff. And you, it adds a little excitement. The birds don't have a lot of contact with each other, so you're not gonna get a lot of that. But you're gonna get, um, the bird, this bird will hop up on a, something and call, and then this one will hop up on something and call. And usually there's three or four of them that are chiming in. Um, so that makes it kind of easy to photograph them um, and you're not disrupting their natural behavior because they're just doing this. Um, that's one thing I really enjoy about photographing grasshopper sparrows is that once you find them, they're not a hard bird to take a picture of and they're not a bad looking bird either. Before I get to my number one bird, um, I want you to leave comments below as to what are your favorite birds that you want to take pictures of, what your nemesis bird is, um, what are your top five birds that you you love taking pictures of. But my number one bird that I um, want to take pictures of, it's my nemesis bird, is the Rosetta Spoonbill. Now Rosetta Spoonbills stand between 30 and 32 inches tall. They are a very big bird. They are rarely seen here in North Carolina. And when I say rarely, there's four or five individuals that are seen here every year. Um, thus, when you do see them, you, when they are reported, you have to go and see them. And usually when I see them, I'm over 100 yards away from them. It's very, usually not great photography opportunities. Um, I have been to, so normally Rosetta Spoonbills live in the southern part of Florida and on the coast of Texas, in the southern part of Texas. Um, they love the heat, they eat a lot of crustaceans, they usually are in brackish water, but when they do come to North Carolina, I always try to chase them down because they're just an exciting bird to see. They're this giant pink bird with this bill that they use for eating crustaceans. Um, and usually when they're here, they're here for three or four days and then they're gone. Um, but still, um, it's great to see them. I just wish I could get a really good photograph of one. Um, and I had been to Florida and tried to get photographs of them um, and not had any luck. It's just that situation just did not lean into it. Um, and I also believe too that part of it is that 
when I went to Florida, I wasn't so intently on photographing birds as I am now. I do intend to travel to Florida again. Um, not exactly sure when, but I do plan on doing that. But Rosetta Spoonbills are number one on my list simply because I haven't got a good picture of them. So I want to thank you for watching. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to this channel because it helps us in the YouTube world. Leave your comments below. Become a Patreon supporter. We are going to have media and uh, surveys for uh, Patreon supporters. So become a Patreon supporter. My name is Sean Leahy. I want to thank you for watching.